Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this, the 26th Sunday after Pentecost. Our radio broadcast this morning is in loving memory of Lester and Lavinia Grove from the Grove family. And the flowers are placed here in loving memory of Marilyn Vandenbosch, whose funeral was here this week. I am Pastor Melinda McVeigh McCluskey, and I will be preaching this morning. Assisting will be Pastor Joel Gutormson. Thank you, Ruth, for playing the organ again today. Our acolytes are Carson Eaton and Olivia Schoonover. Our reader today is Tyler Helgeson, and thank you to the Sean and Julie Helgeson family for ushering. And also thank you to Al Skellinger, Carol Abbey, and Hope Levine for their technical skills. There are lots of announcements in the bulletin. Did you notice that? Did you notice that? <laughs> okay. It's Thanksgiving, Advent, and Christmas, and there is a lot happening in our community at this time. So I invite you to read the bulletin and choose those activities which you would like to be a part of. The only one I want to lift up today is Samaritan's Purse, because next Sunday we need all the shoe boxes returned. If you have any questions, I will say Willie Skellinger can answer them and anyone else on the Life and Growth Board. With that, I invite you to stand as you are able for the call to worship. <coughs> Come, people of God, come and celebrate God's sal gift of salvation. We come without fear, without trusting in God. Come, people of God, hear God's promises and witness God's mighty deeds. In hearing the promises and witnessing the mighty deeds of God, we are strengthened for all that lies ahead. Come, let us worship and praise God by shouting aloud and singing for joy, for God truly is in our midst. Let us sing for joy in my hope is built on nothing less in the...
confession this morning is from the God, um, book of Isaiah, chapter 65. Um, I join me in our confessional prayer. Oh God, we are made like a vision in Luke and a vision of Isaiah. We see wars, hatred, and violence everywhere, yet despair of ever stopping them. We see oppression and injustice and persecution, but fail to rise our voices in prophetic protest. We have become a pessimistic people. Help us believe, really believe, in Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom. In your promise of new heaven and new earth, let your cry be our cry. They shall not hurt or destroy on the holy mountain. Amen. So, sisters and brothers in Christ, our assurance of pardon comes from, again, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, where we hear this good news. God is our strength and our salvation. God's anger is turned away, and in its place we find comfort, steadfast love, and forgiveness. With this hope, we can draw water from the wells of salvation with joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our readings. Good morning. First lesson, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 2a. Malachi, whose name means my messenger, warns that the day of the Lord is coming. On that day, the evil will be destroyed like a stubble in a fire. But then the Son of Righteousness will shine on those who fear God. Hear you from Malachi. Word of faith, word of God, word of life. Amen. Psalm 98. The palm is read responsibly. Sing a new song to the Lord who has done marvelous things, whose right hand and the only arm have won the victory. O Lord, you have made known your victory. You have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. To remember the, your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp, with the harp and the voice of the song. With trumpets and sound of the horn, shout out with joy, glory to the Lord. Let the sea roar and all the and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands, and let the hills come out with joy before the Lord, who comes to the earth. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness, and the peoples with equ equally. The second reading is Philistians chapter 6, verses 6 to 3. Some members of the Philistians community, because of their beliefs and nearness of Christ's return, had ceased to work, living off the generosity of other members of the community. Paul warns them bluntly that if they want to eat, they need to work. Word of God, word of life. According to Luke. Glory to, to you, O Lord. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. 
do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I was in college in the Twin Cities, there was a weekend I got to go home to northwest Minnesota, and I know the route very well. I was on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota, which the dorm was on Cleveland Avenue. Cleveland Avenue became 35W, then I turned on to 694 to head west, and 694 became 94, and at 55 miles an hour, it was a long drive. <laughs> Anybody remember when 55 was the top speed? It added an hour to the trip. Well, when I got to Barnesville, Minnesota, which is east of Moorhead, Fargo-Moorhead, I turned off on Highway 9. Highway 9, boring. You can see for 20 miles. But on this particular time going home, I got a little ways north of the interstate, and I came to this little town, a bar and a house, and a bunch of farm stuff on this side. And as I pulled up, the farmhouse that always had cattle, there were no cattle. And everything was kind of a golden brown color. Now this was the fall, and brown is the color of fall. But it wasn't a normal brown color. And the cattle were gone, and it just felt eerie. And part of me that came to mind is all those movies I've watched where there's been the end times and the rapture and all this. It's like, did something happen and nobody told me? <laughs> it was just a weird feeling. Well, later that night or the next day, found out what happened. You know all that farm stuff on this side? Gigantic anhydrous ammonia tanks, storage tanks for the farms in the area. And what had happened is that one of those tanks had a major um, leak. And so a big cloud of anhydrous ammonia drifted across the road and to the east. And that's what changed the landscape. A very logical explanation for what went on, but it didn't take away my feeling of that apocalypse, something bizarre happening. Well, when we hear the word apocalypse, we often think of the rapture and end times. And our gospel today from Luke is apocalyptic literature. And it is interesting that in this, the last Sunday of Pentecost, almost the last Sunday in the church year, we return to an apocalyptic reading. Because last November, Last November, or last Advent 1, the beginning of the year of Luke, because we've been reading Luke all year, in case you didn't know that's that. We've been reading Luke from Advent 1 through today. And it is interesting to note that Luke begins, our Advent season begins with another apocalyptic test, text from Luke. And it started, our Advent season started with this from Luke 21. Jesus said, 
There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding, foreboding of what is coming upon the earth world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things began to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Scary words. Difficult texts to hear. And in some ways they're very frightening. And to think that we start the Advent season with a text that warns us about the future and we end with a text that is apocalyptic. For many of us, hearing these texts is frightening. But in another way, these texts are very reassuring. These words leave us, though, wondering what Jesus is trying to tell us. And to begin to interpret these words, we need to keep Jesus' words in perspective. And whenever faced with a difficult text, I can hear my seminary professor saying, you need to remember the context. What is the context? We need to step back and think about who Jesus is talking to and who Luke's audience was. And then what does it mean for us living today, 2,000 years later? First of all, Jesus is addressing his disciples. And this is a time prior to his death. And the disciples have absolutely no clue what is about to happen. Jesus is preparing his disciples for a time to come when he is no longer walking with them physically, there for them. A time when they will find themselves persecuted, arrested, imprisoned, and most likely suffer some of them put to death, all because they followed Jesus. But the second people being addressed are the, is the early church, those first followers of the gospel of Jesus. Luke addresses this Christian community after the fall of the temple. Remember the temple had been destroyed and Herod was building it up in the beginning of the gospel. They were looking at the beauty of this temple. All the decorations. It was bigger than it had been in Solomon's time from all we have understand. It was more beautiful than it originally was. But these Christians living after the fall of the temple are questioning what's happening. The temple is no more. Jesus' words have come true. All seems lost to those living in the wake of the destruction of the temple. Luke uses these words with the early Christians to assure them that in all of this chaos, in the fall of the temple, God is still with them. This new community of believers is terrified and frightened. But Luke assures them no matter what happens, God is with them in difficult times. And finally, the third audience are those of us living today. What is Jesus, through Luke's gospel, trying to tell us who are living in modern times, in today's church? Christians around the world are living in uncertain times for various reasons. Just what is Jesus trying to tell us? Well, a part of our understanding of this text comes when we understand the purpose of ap 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 apocalyptic or end time literature. You see, apocalyptic literature uses language and imagery to assure the faithful that they should keep their trust in God, even in the most challenging circumstances. The literature is saying, keep the faith. God is in charge. You see, apocalyptic stories are to be a wake-up call, a warning. 
not necessarily to be taken literally. It might be compared to a story that starts once upon a time. Heard stories like that, once upon a time? What comes to mind when you hear a story that starts once upon a time? I don't know about you, but I hear that, and I know I'm going to learn maybe a lesson about what not to do and what to do, or beware of something. Apocalyptic literature is to wake us up and make us pay attention to what is happening. And it might be kind of similar to hearing these words. Anyone ever hear these words growing up? Wait until your father gets home. When we heard those words, didn't we all go, oops, better change our behavior right now. Better change that attitude. You see, apocalyptic literature, today's text, is about a warning. But it is also words of comfort. Comfort. The issue in Luke's day was this. What are we to do now that the temple has been destroyed? What does this mean for us now? You see, the temple was beautifully restored, and yet in the rebellion, not one stone was left against on top another stone. In fact, history says that it was actually burned and pillared, and nothing was left. But Jesus reminds his disciples that the temple is temporary, that it was built by human achievement. The temple was not permanent. But God's love is steadfast. God is forever. God will look after and protect the faithful. Buildings are only temporary, but God's love will endure through all catastrophes. And then the disciples ask for signs. Signs that the kingdom of God is near. And Jesus reminds his disciples and he reminds us that every age has seen false prophets. Jonestown comes to mind. Nostradamus. And those of us who live through the clock going January 1, 2000. Did the world end? False prophets. Earthquakes. How many of you have relatives in Oklahoma? Or friends in Oklahoma? Lots and lots of earthquakes there. I have a couple of friends that every earthquake they post a new crack in their house. And one of them who is a pastor said, if I believed in all of this rhetoric out there, I believe the end times was coming now. But he goes, God's in charge. And how many natural disasters have we seen in the last few years? They have been with us through all times, for the last 2,000 years and beyond. Natural disasters, things that take place that seem to challenge who we are, are out there. What Jesus says to us is do not be afraid to keep our trust in God. Throughout circumstances that challenge us to our very core of who we are, we are not to be afraid. Bad things will happen and our trust is to be in God who remains a true presence in our lives. There's a saying of Martin Luther, and I particularly like it because I'm a horticulturist by first training. And Martin Luther has, has, been, has been quoted to have said that if he knew the world would end tomorrow, he would plant a tree today. I would too. And Paul addresses the Thessalonians. They kind of gotten lazy. They decided God's coming real soon. Jesus is coming back. We don't have to do anything. We can lay around and just wait. And Paul says, no, there's work to be done in the kingdom. Don't just sit around and wait. Do the work of the kingdom. 
We don't know when the end time will come, when Christ will return. It's tough, but Christian faith does not remove us from conflict. But we might say that conflict does push us to bear fruit. In the midst of persecution, betrayal, hatred, and possibly even death, we are encouraged to witness, to testify to God's faithfulness. And there's no need to memorize a speech, for when the time comes, the Spirit will provide the words needed to witness to Christ. God loves the world. And this world is broken. And there is evil in this world. There is hatred, persecution, betrayal, and even death to those who seek justice in the name of Jesus. The Christian faith does not remove us from conflict, but it empowers us to work for good. However, when we stick to our convictions of our Christian faith in the midst of opposition, something begins to happen. We, we, we acquire our true selves. Keeping our faith in the midst of opposition, we are reminded through our faith that we are children of God. And God promised us re a resurrection and eternal life. In times of trouble, when all seems to be crumbling around us, we are to remember that God is God. God is God. God is our very present help in the past, in the present, and in the time to come. God is God, and God is God in the past, the present, and the future. Amen. Our
living in faith and living out our baptismal promises, we confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our prayers today, uh, we lift up um, the families of Dave Steffens and Marilyn Vandenbosch, and also are praying um, for our veterans who continue to serve our country. Let us pray. With the people of God gathered here and throughout the world, we offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. For the church, for missionaries and teachers, clergy and laity, and all ministers who proclaim the gospel in word and deed, that the Son of Righteousness enlighten the whole earth, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For rivers and lakes, hills and mountains, fruit and vegetables, and animals great and small, that creation thrive and that we care for all God has given us, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For all in authority at the local, state, provincial, national, and international levels. For those who advocate for equality and for relief workers and their supporters, let us pray. For those who hunger or thirst. For those who doubt or are terrified. For those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. And for caregivers that all experience the healing and comfort given through Christ. Let us pray. For those gathered in this place to hear the gospel and receive the good gifts of God through Jesus Christ, that guided by the Holy Spirit, we serve our neighbor who is in need. Let us pray. For our veterans and all who serve or have served, that they may know we honor their service and sacrifice. That they also may know we will protect and serve them as they have served us. Let us pray. In thanksgiving for men and women of every time and place who have died in Christ. Especially as we remember Dave and Marilyn. That we follow their examples of faithful living. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear those who call upon your name. We commend all our spoken and silent prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we are part of the new heaven and the new earth. In God's love, we reach across the differences that divide us. Greet one another in the spirit of reconciliation and peace. Please share the peace.
our offering. in our world. We offer what we have, our visions and our dreams, our witness to your saving acts, our love and justice, our resources to help bring a new heaven and new earth into our midst. We offer you our very lives, that we may be co-workers with you to bring about true change. Amen. Amen. And now a blessing. Go forth into a world that needs new visions. Bring the message of hope and love, of justice and peace to all you meet. Live the dream. Make it a reality. Celebrate endings and new beginnings, challenges and promises. Live the new creation. Amen. Amen.
in peace, Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.